Welcome back to The Human Perspective. Um, today our guest is going to be Julia Bascom, who is with ASAN, the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network. Before we get into the discussion, I wanted to highlight this lovely little cup. I love little cups. Um, that's from Oslo, Norway, an organization called ULOBA, which is a disability rights center for independent living. It's little, it's got braille in the back in Norwegian, and I presume it says Aloba. And the picture is of a man in a wheelchair breaking chains. So I also have this great book bag that they made with the similar logo. So welcome, Julia. Hello. Happy to be here. It's great to have you here. Um, could you give us a little bit of information about who you are? Yes. Um, so my name is Julia Bascom. Um, I run the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, which is a disability rights organization focusing um, sort of on autism, run by and for autistic adults. Um, so I'm an autistic adult and I have other disabilities as well. Um, I'm originally from New Hampshire. I grew up, you know, on a dirt road. Um, and then I moved to DC, which is very different, um, about five years ago. Um, you're going to notice me fidgeting and so on and so forth. This is a tangle, um, which is just a toy to fidget with while I'm talking, which helps me, like a lot of autistic people, sort of concentrate on what's happening. And we actually have our name and our website on this as well. So it's a little bit of professional self-promotion. Tell us about your role as the director of ASAN. Because you're a young, disabled woman running a national organization. So we're small, um, so I do a lot of different things. Um, I do a lot of fundraising, I do a lot of policy, and then I'm in charge of making the organization function as an organization and grow. We're pretty young, um, I think this, we're about 11 years old, um, and we've only had an office for about six years, so we're still doing a lot of figuring out. We figured out who we are and what we do. Um, but then working with other organizations and building those relationships and building a reputation for really effective advocacy. Um, so I go to a lot of meetings. I talk on the phone a lot, uh, much more than I ever thought I'd ever be able to talk at all in my life. Um, usually by the end of the day, I have, I have no speech left because I've had to use it all up um, talking to other folks. Um, I guess, hypothetically, the goal would be in the future to have um, a world that is so accustomed to autistic people having this kind of job that if I couldn't talk or if someone doing my job couldn't talk and used a speech device, that would be all right. Um, right now, if I try to use a device in a meeting, um, I, I can't interrupt people very well. So I still have to figure out that barrier and then we'll be all set. So last year is a challenging year and this year will also be a challenging year uh, because of many of the proposed cuts that are, are being put forward. Maybe you could give us a little bit of information about what you consider to be one of the major contributions that ASAN with other groups has made in the past year. So in the past year, ASAN focused on defending the Medicaid program and the Affordable Care Act. Um, and okay, we health care with pieces yes, of sorry. legislation. Uh, and we were successful, by and large, which was really exciting. Um, when we started working at the beginning of the year, and not just ASAN, but other big groups like ADAPT and New York and some other folks, um, I don't think very many people really knew about Medicaid, including a lot of the people who use Medicaid services every day. Um, and by the end of the year, A, the Medicaid program still existed, which was our goal, and B, a lot more people understood about it and understood the role that it had in their lives. Um, one of the things, my organization's motto is nothing about us without us. And that's a really common disability rights saying, and it means that we believe that any time autism or disability or a program like Medicaid that we rely on is being discussed, autistic people and people with disabilities should be at the table leading that conversation. And in order to do that, we have to understand what people are talking about. And so we discovered that a lot of the information that exists on Medicaid, including the information that we've been putting out, was really hard. Um, I think for most people to understand, and then especially for people who rely on Medicaid services um, and maybe aren't, you know, lawyers. Um, so we developed um, accessible materials um, aimed specifically at people with other, you know, intellectual and developmental disabilities. So what does that mean, accessible? Um, so for us, 
it means that we're talking about like a third or fourth grade reading level with lots of pictures and not too much text on the page and that break that includes all of the information so we didn't simplify it we didn't dumb it down we didn't leave anything out um, but we broke it down into all as many steps as necessary and showed people how they were connected um, I think a lot of times when we talk about accessibility we talk about physical accessibility um, or whether or not you know a TV show has captions or a picture has an image description but we don't talk about cognitive accessibility whether it can be understood and that's really where we focus and I think there have been a lot of people who've been getting the materials yes and at the end of this we're gonna have a website so people can go to the website and can get the information I mean what I've said to Julie and other people on her staff who worked on this is that um, the reason they put these materials together was so people with autism and other kinds of developmental disabilities would be able to get this information. But the reality is, it's a very complex issue, as Julie was saying, and these materials are beneficial for anyone. Yeah. So you told me that you're part of the ADA generation. Mm -hmm. Tell me what that means to you. I think it means a few different things. So on a, on a very literal level, it means that I was born after the ADA had passed. And 1990. I just, right. So I'm very young. Um, and I always went to school with the ADA and IDEA in effect. Um, so in theory, I had a lot of rights and a lot of progress was made and my life was really different from people, especially people um, you know, with developmental disabilities than it would have been maybe 20 years ago. Um, but the flip side of that is that um, I, and I think a lot of other people in the ADA generation, really saw this gap between what our rights theoretically were in the law and what our lives were actually like. And we saw how far we'd come and how far we still had to go. Um, and that really propelled me to become involved in disability advocacy, first at the state level and then at a national level, because the work isn't done, because it's going to take a very long time. I think, I don't think I'm going to solve ableism. I think that there will be someone, you know, in my job 50 or 60 years from now, but hopefully we're closer. Mm -hmm. And I have a question. Um, as a woman, mm -hmm. myself a woman, you a woman, um, when I was growing up, I really had very few disabled women role models. Mm -hmm. And that was something that was a big issue for me, and it's better today, but still a big issue. How do you address that issue of getting role models and peers? I really feel that. Um, the first time I met um, other women who were autistic and who were parents, I cried. Just th That had never seemed like a possibility, because mm -hmm. I hadn't seen it. Uh, that hadn't been modeled for me. I didn't have a lot of references to draw on. I'm the first woman with my kind of disability leading like a, a national disability rights issue with a national organization or the national office. And that's really hard because you can't look to a lot of role models and exemplars and examples of people who've gone before you. Um, so I think a lot about talking to other people who have those similar experiences, even if that experience is also not having someone to look to. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the goal is for it eventually to be very commonplace and very boring. So right now, I think people have a really hard time um, conceiving of someone with like a cognitive disability having a leadership position, even though we've been doing that for a very long time. Um, and what we would like to see someday is for someone to have my job to be like me, like someone who needs support in a day-to-day -day life, someone who has a, who's autistic or has an intellectual disability, um, and for that to just be normal and boring because people have seen those examples, they've seen those stories, they've seen it on TV, they have friends and family. One of the things about being a member of the ADA generation is that the kids I went to school with who didn't have disabilities went to school with students with disabilities. So they expect the world to look different than their parents did. Um, but it's a very slow process. So carrying on with that theme, um, of late we've seen more representation of mm -hmm. Uh, characters in the movies and on TV who have various forms of disabilities. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, are there certain principles that you uh, adhere to when you're looking at a film and something that you may want to share with the audience about what you think they should be thinking about when they're watching something? Yeah. 
So I think stories are really important. And a media often gives you a really good opportunity to tell stories that you aren't even seeing in your life. And so the first question is just, like, is it a good story? If it's a story about a person with a disability, that doesn't mean I'm going to want to read it or watch it. Uh, it needs to be good. <laughs> um, and then beyond that, in terms of like the representation of people with disabilities ourselves, I think it has a lot to do with not, not just has the writer like read a textbook, but do they know people with disabilities? Do they know that, that our whole life isn't just a checklist of symptoms? Is the person with a disability like a plot device for other characters? Or do they have their own story and their own function? It's stuff like that. And you can usually tell when there's that authenticity and when the goal is to tell a story that includes people with disabilities as opposed to a very touching story about encountering a disabled person at one moment in your life. Um, and then, you know, were there disabled writers involved? Did they audition of disabled actors? Things like that. Is there a film or a TV program that you think about in a positive or negative way? Um, I think the TV show Community, which isn't on, has a pretty good representation of an autistic adult. And that was written by an autistic person, which is one of the reasons it's so authentic. Where can people find it? Um, that's on Hulu right now. Okay. And it's on like DVDs and everything. Um, my community has had a lot of criticism of Atypical in particular recently, which seemed to really be written without really knowing any real autistic people. Um, and the doctor? And the good doctor, I haven't watched, but I've heard I've heard mixed things. Some people mm -hmm. really like it, and I think it's one of those things where everybody has different experiences, and so they'll feel differently depending on that. Um, and the last thing I wanted to say, I haven't watched the show in like ten years, so I might not like it anymore. <laughs> um, but when I was growing up, we watched a lot of Monk, um, yes, <laughs> and that was really important to me um, because it was an example of a man with a disability who needed daily help and was still a person and had a job. Um, and it was really important for my parents when they realized that I wasn't going to be able to live independently. They had sort of like a frame of reference for that that wasn't tragic. Um, and that was so important. Um, so I don't know, I haven't watched it in a really long time. I don't know if I'd still like it. I love it was, Monk. It's on reruns and I right? love to watch it. It was yes. very important to me. And we're going to close um, by saying that we all, you have, a, have given us a great picture of you with your cat, <laughs> Galaxy. Yes. And uh, Galaxy is playing an important part in your life. When stress is there, she can go yes. home. And you'll love the picture. So thank you so very much for being with us today and sharing your story. And we'll see you again the next time. Thank you.